So I'm August. Um, I'm a Blue Waters graduate fellow for 2016, um, and my talk is on um, preserving intrapatient variants and how it improves phylogenetic inference of HIV transmission. Um, so I want to start with uh, um, acknowledgments um, for my Center for AIDS research group, um, my lab research group, um, my, which includes my advisors, um, Casey Dunn and Chip Lawrence at Brown, um, as well as thank my point of contact at Blue Waters, um, Colin McLean. Um, so a little bit of background, um, how I'm going to explain how transmission networks um, can be, we can use phylogenies as sort of uh, proxies for them. Um, so uh, what are phylogenetic trees? So um, the, they're trees that sort of have information about relatedness of organisms at tips. Uh, so on here, um, on this tree, tip one and tip two are more closely related to each other than to tips three, four, and five, um, and that's reflected on this tree. And so um, in the absence of reliable patient contact histories, phylogenies can be proxies for transmission networks. So clinicians um, for, uh, are generally interested in transmission networks and sort of transmission events in history for both like prevention and treatment reasons. And so, um, but right, uh, you have to get, generally get patient contact histories in order to be able to actually know the transmission history. And that's, uh, those patient contact histories that either people don't want to give them or they can be unreliable, um, especially in stigmatized uh, diseases like HIV. And so on the right here, um, uh, in the absence of that, we can actually use phylogenies to represent these networks. So on the right here, we have a simple transmission network, person one, infected person two, infected person three, infected person four. And so by sort of sequencing the viral um, uh, sequences within the individuals, you can isolate that from uh, people's bloodstream. Um, you can actually sort of build a phy phylogeny of those viral sequences as they evolve. So on the left here then is the sort of appropriate tree to represent the network on the right. So this sort of red sequence is patient one's viral population and when there's a transmission event, um, it goes on to patient two and it becomes yellow and then green and blue and so forth. And so this is the full tree. And so we can see that here, person three and person four, um, they share a most recent common ancestor. We can infer there was a transmission link between these two individuals. So this leads us to um, the phylogenetic workflow, which is actually what my dissertation is on. Um, so uh, essentially, this is a workflow. Um, there are several steps involved in, t in terms of building these phylogenetic trees. So we have to start from data or sequencing reads. Um, and the, these reads are sort of like 100 base pair to like 250 base pair fragments of the genome um, due to technical reasons. And so we have to do this step called assembly to build these genomes. Um, so we assemble genomes from these reads. Um, from the genomes then we uh, sort of try to align them, so find the um, positions at which sort of the base pairs go together best. So we build a multiple sequence alignment and then finally from this multiple sequence alignment we can build the transmission tree. Um, so, uh, so my work is on sort of this assumption within this phylogenetic workflow um, for transmission inference. So we, we sort of assume that the tips of these trees are single entities. So here on this tree again, we have sort of person one, person two, person three, person four. And so the current approach um, from, in terms of assembling the genome from the data is so you sequence the, these individuals' uh, viral genomes. There's a whole population of reads. And then sort of you take the consensus genome, which is essentially you take the base pair that is the most frequent at each site. So if a site is like 60% A and like 40% C, like you'll take A at that site. Um, so that's, and then you sort of use it as like a single genome and build the tree. Uh, however, uh, with rare exceptions, these, um, these trees are, these tips are actually summaries of populations. So right, there is an entire population uh, evolving inside an individual of viral particles, and so there's actually something that we call a viral phylogeny um, within every individual as well. And this also affects um, uh, tr uh, inference of transmission history because uh, only certain viral particles are passed on to the next individual. So this is uh, not an issue if we suspect that the variation can be summarized by the mode or the consensus genome. So on the left here, we have a set of red, uh, dots and most of them are blue, only one of them is red and green. And so actually it would pre be pretty fair to sort of summarize this set of uh, dots with a single blue dot. Um, however, is it an issue if it can't? So now on the left we have um, equal amounts of red, green, and blue dots, and so we can no longer say a single blue dot can represent all of these dots. 
After all, we ultimately care about the transmission tree. We don't care that sort of, uh, we don't care about the genomes. Well, we do for like drug resistant mutations, but we don't care about the genomes for inference of transmission events. So uh, this next part is on showing that preserving intrapatient variation actually is important. Um, so a simple thought experiment. Here we have individuals A, B, and C. Um, a is three red dots, two blue dots. B is three red dots, two yellow dots. And C is three yellow dots and two red dots. So under the consensus method, um, actually we would see a tree like the following where uh, A and B um, would both be sort of summarized as red and so they would um, be seen as more closely related to each other than to C. Um, however, if all the variation was accounted for, um, we might actually expect to see a tree like this instead where B and C are more closely related to each other than to A. And this is because sort of B and C have like both red and yellow dots in similar populations of each. Um, and so some simple simulations actually show the same thing. So on the right is a tree that I simulated where the colors represent different individuals and sort of the tips are um, sets of sort of virus particles evolving um, inside the individuals. And then on the left, um, I did a standard phylogenetic workflow with a consensus genome. I built the tree using a program called RaxML and in fact, uh, you can see that the ordering of um, and the positioning of the sort of different individuals does not reflect um, how the order of transmission events in the true tree. So we should probably try to account for that variation. Um, so uh, the approach that uh, we took is something called using something called profile hidden Markov models, and so um, they're basically essentially uh, just like probabilistic representations of multiple sequence alignments. So what I mean by that is sort of if you have like a, um, two sites here, uh, you would have a start state with probability one, move on to a match state where you see half A and half T, move on to the next state where all of it is C, and then finally go to the end state. Um, and profile hidden Markov uh, models, they can also model um, insertions and deletions. So a deletion state is just represented by here by going to sort of a deletion with probability one quarter and to a match state with uh, probability three quarters. And similar thing for an insertion. So here's an insertion at sort of position four. Um, so from match state three, you could go to an insertion with probability a quarter. So uh, what we can do actually then is build these read profiles from read alignments. So we can make an alignment of all the reads and instead of then taking the consensus genome, we actually build these read profiles. Um, and then from those read profiles, we can sample genomes. Um, so we can sample several, and then uh, finally build alignments in trees with those samples. So this leads to something that we call the synthetic approach. Um, so essentially, uh, this, this is the step that is different in our workflow, uh, where we build a read profile instead of taking the consensus genome and then simulate um, sort of end sequences, however much you think needs, you need to capture the variation. And then, uh, from those end sequences, we build a multiple sequence alignment of all those sequences, and then finally, we infer the tree again. Um, and I put blue waters here because this is a step um, where blue waters um, can be tremendously helpful because, uh, of course, um, as often happens with high data, uh, with, sorry, high dimensional inference, uh, each, each piece in this workflow is a high dimensional inference problem, um, as often happens with big data problems. Um, so going from data to uh, genomes, we use a tool called Hammer. Going from genomes to multiple sequence alignment, we use a tool called MAFT. And then um, going to trees, we use uh, either RaxML for maximum likelihood tree inference or Mr. Bayes for Bayesian tree inference. So, uh, so some results. Um, so we have, we essentially have one real data set. Um, so data sets with actual where uh, you know the entire transmission history are very hard to come by, um, but we have uh, one that is from individuals who were newly diagnosed with HIV in 2013, um, and we know the transmission history for five of those individuals. Um, and so what we did is we sort of, uh, we compared, we took, did the consensus approach on this data set, the synthetic approach with 10 sequences per individual, what we call it a collapse tree. And then we also did 100 runs of this synthetic approach with one sequence per individual. 
Um, then we computed the Robinson folds distance, so it's just sort of just a distance metric between trees, um, from all approaches and then perform multidimensional scaling. Um, and so this is uh, sort of the results of that. Um, the circle here represents the HMM, uh, the consensus approach, so the tree built from, the consens uh, from an alignment of consensus genomes. And then the square represents um, the tree sort of from the synthetic approach with 10 sequences per individual. Um, and also, we did a k-means clustering with k equals 3, and we can see that there are sort of like three roughly um, different clusters of trees here. And so that sort of suggests that um, using the consensus genome approach, it really does not capture all of the variation present within these individuals. Um, and then, so we also sort of took the took a look at the tree sets. Um, so the consensus tree set was in the green earlier, and the synthetic was in the blue. And um, so this is the five individuals we had the transmission history for. And so the consensus tree set um, did not, was not able to recover that transmission history, but the synthetic approach was. Um, of course, that's only a single real data set, and we need to be able to continue to validate this approach. So this leads to um, TransmissSim, which is a tool um, I wrote that simulates transmission networks, phylogenies, genomes, and reads. Uh, so this is a generative, so basically we sort of go in the other direction. We have a generative model of patient reads from transmission events. So um, there's the transmission network, the transmission tree, viral phylogeny, as I talked about earlier, genomes, and then reads. Um, and so this is another aspect in which um, Blue Waters has been uh, very helpful because, again, um, these, yeah, uh, because there are so many parameters that go into um, these components, and in order to sort of do like a full um, parameter sweep and to validate my approach, um, I will need to be able to use Blue Waters. Um, so uh, in general, I put together a, a bunch of different tools. There's, I use a tool called Outbreaker, or a package called Outbreaker for simulating the networks. Um, I wrote the part that uh, gets the tree from the networks. Um, I use a tool called SimFi for simulating the viral phylogeny, uh, a package called PyVolve um, for the genomes, and a package called ART for the data. And, and most of this is done in Python. Um, so uh, basically, we uh, simulated a bunch of reads and trees, and then we ran the approaches back on them. And so um, these are bootstrap results on one tree from the simulations. Um, so bootstraps is sort of a method to um, evaluate confidence in the tree, um, and specifically splits in the tree, so um, confidence that this split exists. So 100 means 100% 100 confidence, and zero means that the split actually never appeared at all. Um, and so the red values in, are the uh, values for the consensus approach, and the blue values are the values for the synthetic approach. And so. Um, well, if you take a, I, I'm not sure you can see the tree that well, but, uh, but uh, in this case, actually, the synthetic approach always had higher bootstrap values than the uh, consensus approach. Um, and so this is the same, this is the plot from, of the same tree. So all, all points above the diagonal had higher bootstrap support for the synthetic approach than the consensus approach. Um, and this is a similar plot on 10 simulations. So um, in this one, there are actually a couple dots that had higher um, bootstrap support for the consensus approach than the synthetic approach. We took a look at them, and they all came from the same tree. So that means so that one of the simulations, um, the consensus approach actually did better than the synthetic. Um, so uh, why blue waters? Um, so uh, we, with that uh, MDS plot we made earlier, that was 100 samples. We want to um, do an MDS density plot with 10,000 trees um, to sort of look for conclusive regions of variation. Um, and so this will actually take um, about 10,000 node hours. Um, and so with the remaining um, allocation, uh, I also want to do much more than 10 simulations. I want to do additional simulations with, for validation with parameter sweeps. Um, and so some Blue Waters products that will come out of um, this is a, a preprint of this manuscript is actually going to be up next week, um, and we aim to have it be a reproducible manuscript, um, and you can also reproduce the figures at well, as well. And TransmissSim is also um, an open source tool on GitHub. Um, it is not, well, you can, you can try to run it if you want, but I would not, I wouldn't personally not try until like maybe September, but we, I do aim to have it. Um, 
like uh, packaged and uh, ready to use by September. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>